Hi, everyone. Welcome to Data Byte 144. My name is Roberto Lara Guzman. I'm the producer for this event alongside my production team behind the curtain. Uh, we'll be spending the next hour together, so let, let's get ourselves grounded. Uh, data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce uh, original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. Data and Society began in New York City, an island in a, uh, in a network of hills and rivers in, in the Atlantic Northeast known as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral lands of the Leni Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a vast array of servers and computer devices. But in the United States, much of this infrastructure sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory. We commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. Let me. Uh, begin the program uh, by introducing my guests today, Ellen Pao, Yang Hong, and Mackenzie Mack uh, will be joining us to discuss the, their latest report on how remote work since COVID-19 has been uh, exacerbating harm and what companies need to know and do, and also what they learned during the process uh, about data equity, intersectionality, and positionality that might help you in your respective work. Uh, Project Include, which is the, uh, the, the, the organization that is kind of bringing us here today, is a nonprofit that uses data and advocacy to accelerate diversity and inclusion solutions in the tech industry. Their mission is to give everyone a fair chance to succeed in tech. Welcome everybody, thank you for your patience. Uh, Ellen, I'll turn it over to you now. The mic is yours. Great. Thank you so much. I am a huge fan of Data and Society and the work that you do. This is my second time um, in front of the group, and I'm very honored to be here with Mackenzie Mack and Yang Hong um, to talk about the work that we did on, um, on looking at how different communities of people are, are harmed by the changes that we've seen in the workplace. Um, one thing I wanted to note is kind of a context of this conversation where one year after the murder of George Floyd, um, we are a few months since um, Google fired its AI lead, um, Timna Gebru, and uh, kind of really uh, kind of put down the research that she had been working on uh, as a Black expert in AI. And I think this conversation is incredibly important in this time and in this context. I think um, understanding the work that Yang really drove as our lead data scientist and the perspective that McKinsey brought to help inform all of the work that we did is something that I would love to see all organizations do. I think it's really powerful. It really informed our report and our research um, throughout the whole process and, uh, and it's a much better um, report and we've seen a lot of response to it and we continue to have a long tail of inquiries because of the kind of novel approach and results that we found. So um, I'm super excited to be back together with McKinsey and Yang to talk about it. Uh, we finished a report in March and, um, you know, I, I really want to um, hear McKinsey uh, and their approach to, you know, what were the things that we learned from this research and from this report? And so just in, in uh, thank you so much for that introduction, first of all, Ellen. Um, and so I'm wondering, would you like me to go into some of those main findings at this point? Okay, great. So um, it's interesting because at the, the very beginning of this call before many of you joined, we had a, a mini conversation around um, some of the, the ways in which we responded to the findings in the report. Um, and, I, and I will say that, um, you know, what's been really interesting is encountering a number of folks, some who were really, some were really surprised by, by the findings, and then others who I think were, were finding themselves in a, in a space of um, not being very surprised by a number of the things that we found. 
So just to kind of cover a, a few things around things that, that um, came to light during our report and in our findings, and one is that 42% of trans respondents experienced increased gender harassment in the age of COVID-19 during this time, that Black non-binary people and women are nearly three times as likely as non-binary people and women in general to experience race-based hostility, that 85% of workers are experiencing increased anxiety since COVID-19, so that is across the board, um, that 98% of people who experienced increased gender-based harassment were women and are non-binary people. Um, and those are just a few, a, a few of the highlights of things that came out of this report, but there are many more. So for us in general, you know, in thinking about the ways in which we are uh, defining harm, thinking about harm, uh, we took a very highly intersectional approach to that, um, which I know that Yang will speak to later in our conversation. Um, but, but what we're seeing is something that maybe many of us on this call may have already known, and maybe some of us may be learning for the first time in that, right, um, Asian, Black, Indigenous, Latinx um, workers, employees are disproportionately affected, you know, by the ways in which harm is being experienced in the remote workplace. And that also is inclusive of, um, of women and non-binary people specifically. Thanks. And I'd love to hear from you, Yang, about what, um, I guess I'd love to get into the methodology, but from a high level, like what were the results that really um, hit home for you? Yeah, it's really exciting to just, you know, have this mini reunion here and thanks to Data Society's community for having us too. I think even before getting into, you know, how we looked at the data, um, I kind of want to reframe what we think of when we think of data in the first place. So I think we often think of it as facts, we often think of it as science, um, and we often think of it as neutral or objective. Um, and I like to challenge that, you know, data like technology um, as a product of technology is not neutral or objective because the people and systems that create it are not neutral objective. Um, and that includes, you know, me looking at this data. Um, and so I think as part of that, you know, when we, when we had a survey design, you know, we asked all these questions, we asked about 150 different questions. We had about 3000 survey respondents um, from all over the United States and internationally, uh, you know, you think about how much data that is, um, and you think about the whole universe of questions that we could possibly be asking. Um, and, you know, when you look at everyone, uh, you know, averaged across all of these multitudes and complexities of people and their experiences, um, you know, you actually find very little. And, you know, our, our initial thing, the only thing that we found by just looking at everyone across every type of experience was that, you know, mental health was a pervasive issue for everyone. And, you know, I think if we just had a report that said that, um, it wouldn't have changed anything. And I think everyone would have realized that it, we were staying the obvious. Um, and so, you know, I think we then started to think, well, what other questions can we be asking and should we be asking? Um, and we really decided to focus on this question of, well, who was being harmed and who was being harmed you know, disproportionately and how and why were they being harmed? Um, and we, you know, we use this word harm um, to really encompass you know, things beyond uh, and including harassment, um, which may look really different for different kinds of people as well. Uh, so I think when we did that, you know, from a high level, we started to find a lot of things, um, including, you know, some of the things that Mackenzie mentioned earlier. And, you know, I think for me personally, um, part of what was, I guess, surprising is that none of it was surprising. And uh, uh, I think reflect on that, it was very validating um, and, you know, a recognition of my personal experiences in tech. Um, and I think that's been something that's been resonating for a lot of people as well. So one of the things that um, we did was to really take a data equity approach along with the intersectionality um, and the intersectional lens that we used, um, we took a data equity approach. And I'd love for you to um, describe that approach, Yang, and then also share um, what that looked like in, um, in the work that we did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen really briefly, uh, the set of questions 
Um, and I think often, you know, speaking to myself as a data scientist, um, you know, we're very eager to want to dig into it to find answers. And, you know, I think before we do that, there's this, um, we can take a step back and think, well, what questions are we even asking? And specifically, what questions are we not asking? And by not asking those questions, what are we missing? So, um, you know, this is just a little bit into our process. You can read more in our 10 page methodology in the report. Um, and, you know, it's questions for data storytellers. Um, and, you know, when I think of anyone who's interacting with data as a data storyteller, um, it becomes really important to ask these questions across, you know, our data gathering, biography, investigation, interpretation, and data governance. Um, and across all of these, I think the common theme is a power analysis. And uh, I don't mean, you know, statistical power analysis and sample size. I mean, um, you know, what kind of powers of oppression or dominance exist um, both within the context of our work and our data and also how it affects us as our researchers um, and our ultimate impacts and goals. Um, and, you know, I think maybe we can just take a moment to look at some of these questions. Um, in particular, you know, when we think about data equity, um, there's this idea that, you know, one, we do not disaggregate our data um, and, you know, disaggregation looks like racial disaggregation. It looks like gender disaggregation. It looks like any aspect of disaggregation that um, if we don't do that would essentially erase or invisibilize people's experiences. Um, what we find that, you know, data equity is not just a nice to have. It is actually just better data science. Um, and I think that's really important to, to know it's better data science, it's better journalism, um, it's better decision making. Um, and you know, I think ultimately us asking all of these questions and then iteratively trying to answer them um, in you know, ways that are complex and you know, ultimately still limited, uh, behind all of that is this idea that data, uh, again, is not just about facts, it's not a story of neutrality, data is a story of people in power um, and how we create, analyze, interpret and change based on it is a story we choose um, and an outcome of power in society. Great, and I, one of the pieces that really came together in this report were the, were the, the different levels of power and how it, you know, it was clear within these tech companies that the power was held um, by the white men and the, the rest of the workers were having different experiences. And when people can't see those experiences and aren't experiencing it themselves, you end up with, um, I was a little bit surprised at the level of, you know, the lack of harm to certain communities and then the level of harm comparatively, especially um, for other communities. Um, I'd love to hear from you, Mackenzie, about how, um, what does it mean to be subjectively aware, which is a term that um, you feel very strongly about for good reason. And also like how, how um, you know, what, how positionality comes into play and what, um, one of the things that we made a big effort to do was to include people from different backgrounds, you know, as our funders, as our interviewees, as our experts and within um, our survey respondent pool. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, what impact that had and why it's important. So I think just sort of as a, as a first response, I'd say that positionality is everything. And I know that you mentioned that term um, subjectively aware. That was a term that was first impressed upon me by the Trans Journalists Association, which is also known as TGA. So they have a, a style guide for editors, for journalists, for writers, for media makers. And it focuses on the ways in which people have very erroneous, erroneously and harmfully written about trans communities and the ways in which they can um, be re harm reductive in, in terms of the ways in which they write about trans communities in the future, both trans and non-binary communities. Um, and so when uh, that, that term means that, you know, as opposed to us thinking that it's actually possible for us to be completely objective, it's actually possible for us to actually remove our bias. We recognize that we can't really remove bias from ourselves 
if there's bias, bias in itself is not inherently evil or harmful or terrible. And then there's bias that because of the ways in which we've been conditioned to believe it is actually incredibly harmful and dangerous, especially for those that are most marginalized within our society. So to be subjectively aware means to be um, aware of the ways in which our lived experiences, our privileges, the privileges that we hold, the marginalizations that we experience, shape the ways in which we perceive ourselves and other people and how that has an impact on, the, on how we make decisions. And then it also means to be aware of the fact that no matter how hard we try, unconsciously our bias is going to manifest itself. And the only way for, for that bias to be countered is if we're working in environments and in communities, especially when it comes to research, with people that are um, can name that, people who've had that lived experience that's different from our own, who are able to name those biases and who are able to right, really be able to show that to us and make that visible. Um, and for us in this process, one of the reasons that was so helpful is if I can offer a brief story, um, it reminds me of when Ellen, when you had an interview a couple of months ago, right after the report came out, and there was someone who said, well, you know, this person is a, a leader in tech and some of the findings that you're sharing, they're not seeing that, they're not experiencing that. And I remember you saying, um, well, you know, I validate that person's experience. Like I affirm that this is something that they're not seeing. And at the same time, just because an individual person isn't seeing the harm being done, doesn't mean the harm isn't happening. And that for me, just like, you know, had a um, something that I, that I knew in coming into that and, and seeing me be interviewed and speak to that. But I think it's something that for many of us is something that we have to unlearn um, but in terms of our process and the ways in which we engage in data gathering and interp data interpretation and then reporting, we were very mindful of the ways in which our positionality shaped how we were reviewing and, and considering the, those findings. And then even down to um, one thing that I really, really appreciated is even down to our language and terminology. There's a lot of specificity in our report as a means of being um, as open and as honest and explicit as possible about the ways in which we know language in itself can be really limiting. Um, and also there are ways in which we are learning a lot about positionality and identity where English language, our language, the language of the report that, that it was written in really hasn't even caught up yet, right? So the ways in which we're experiencing identity. So for, for, to answer your question, I think that recognizing that positionality is, was everything. Thank you. It's so helpful. It, um, I learned a lot in this process of um, from everybody on the team, and that was a very um, it, it was just great. Like to have so many different perspectives and to be learning so many different nuances, and to continue to evolve and to see um, changes throughout. Um, I guess I'd love to hear from you, Yang, about you know how these. Um, how these perspectives shaped an iterative process and what maybe one or two examples of that looked like because we really made a lot of progress and you know we talked about in our prep call how we were meeting every week and there were definitely conversations that were rich and productive and pushed um, you know and, and pushed the report in different directions so it'd be great to hear um, some of the examples that you found really helpful yeah totally um, and, and, you know, I think just echoing what Mackenzie was saying earlier about positionality, uh, I think as part of being able to come in with our positionality, um, there has to have, you know, there has to be a feeling of mutual um, trust and, you know, respect and, you know, to have that expertise and that personal positionality be heard. Um, and so, you know, I just want to say, even just thank you to both of you um, and to our other co-author Caroline um, so that we can have these conversations because I think you know when we talk about data equity it's not just about oh let's disaggregate this data is a question of how do we do that and in the process of doing that who are we you know choosing to erase or not erase um, and also just cognizant of how you know the the dominant way in which we did apply knowledge gathering here is um, a from a framework of western statistics um, and, you know, I want to acknowledge that's not the only way of knowledge gathering um, and it, it's, you know, it favors noticing certain patterns across groups of people, um, but it's particularly weak at understanding the hows and whys of how those patterns come to be. I think that said, uh, I'll just go through, you know, maybe one or two examples of that complexity. You know, we talk about intersectional analysis and one question we had at some point is, 
um, you know, when we think about who's experiencing race-based hostility at work, how does gender, you know, potentially factor into that? Um, and is there a difference? And so when you look at everyone, um, what you see is, you know, 7% of men uh, and 15% of women and or non-binary people experienced an increase in race-based hostility in work. And so the question is, if we just stop here, um, you know, what, what are we missing? And one thing I'll note here is when we aggregate everyone, we disproportionately emphasize, you know, the majority of respondents um, in any category. And here, you know, 57% of the respondents to this question about, you know, racial hostility were white. Um, in contrast, only 1% of those white respondents said they had experienced an increase in race-based hostility. Um, so, you know, if we separate that out, what we reflect is uh, this average makes it, you know, 10 times uh, as low for white people who are experiencing racial hostility. Um, and it's actually, you know, twice as high for people who um, are, you know, identify as non-white who are experiencing racial hostility. So this average, this initial average um, doesn't represent anyone. Um, and I think that's sort of a big thing to, to really reflect on. So then when we look at this, um, you know, with the ability to disaggregate across race and ethnicity, um, and I think that ability itself had to come way before the analysis. It had to come in the survey design. It had to come in conversations that, you know, Ellen and Mackenzie conducted and informed um, so that we could even do the disaggregation. Well, we find that, you know, only 7% of respondents to this question were black. Um, and so no average across everyone would have revealed their patterns of experience. And when we do disaggregate, we find that, you know, 41% of black men and 43% of black women and our non-binary people experience an increase in race-based hostility. And we find that, you know, that in fact, gender does make a difference um, that women and our non-binary people were twice as likely as men to experience um, an increase in race-based hostility. Um, and, you know, I think especially, you know, from my positionality as an Asian woman, knowing, you know, the, the just vast distribution of differences um, under that umbrella term, which was, you know, initially invented as a, as a political activist term, um, if we can disaggregate further, we find that, you know, more South and Southeast Asian women um, at, you know, about 38% experience an increase in racial hostility uh, compared with East Asian, multiracial Asian women at 25% or East Asian men at 14%. Um, and, you know, here I want to also note that it, this is both way more insightful, it's a much deeper understanding, um, but even here it's still limited. Um, and we had, you know, multiple iterative conversations, for example, around how do we think about people who are multi or biracial um, or ethnic in their identities. Um, and, you know, even noting the fact that there are other factors at play here, for example, colorism across the board, um, you know, dynamics of uh, global notions of racial hierarchy, like casteism, things like that, um, that we weren't able to really do justice to because, uh, you know, we don't have that kind of nuance in our, in our survey design. Um, so I think it's really important to think about like those complexities and also to think about them from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, I think the last thing I'll say here is, again, we were applying this, you know, Western statistical framework, which meant that, you know, what you didn't hear in any of these statistics is the experiences of indigenous people or um, Middle Eastern people. Um, and, you know, we didn't have enough sort of quote unquote statistical power to be able to make these um, percentage claims. But at the same time, you know, we do include them in the report to acknowledge there is ongoing harm there as well. And, uh, you know, even if it's one person or three people that those experiences are just as valid as, you know, the 100 people um, or 200 people. What I found really interesting and difficult was like this, this challenge of, you know, wanting to get to that level of um, comfort with the number of respondents um, and the pressure that put on us to try to 
like include multiracial people into a category or to try to prioritize the races within or ethnicities within um, a person's identities and, uh, and, and the harm that you can create in that process. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm thinking also about how um, even after the survey design and before the analysis, there was a period where we're just doing outreach for people to respond to the survey. Um, and I think, you know, initially um, when I was looking at who was responding, it was uh, overwhelmingly, um, you know, white, mostly cisgender women. Um, and again, you know, I think thanks to the efforts of Ellen and McKenzie and, uh, you know, our other co-author Caroline um, really made a push to do more deliberate outreach um, and make sure that, you know, we are not just representing, uh, you know, a particular slice of people in tech. Um, and I think, again, there's like so many things that happen even before the analysis to enable the analysis to be a bit more equitable, um, regardless of, you know, how much we can, we can do or how much time we have. I think it's, it's always worth it because it means we have deeper understanding, we have deeper findings, um, we can, you know, reflect reality better. Yeah, and I also, uh, there were a lot of groups that helped us in that effort, like Code 2040 and um, Black Girls Code, and uh, I'm going to forget some, um, Lesbians Who Tech, um, uh, Black and Brown Founders. So there, there were some groups that helped us as we worked hard. Trans Tech, uh, McKinsey Notes. Yes, and they were very helpful in, in getting our numbers to where they were, but, but it's also hard in an industry where so many people have been shut out and have a hard time um, thriving. So I want to take this last time, I think we're almost out of time, so very quickly to kind of um, talk a little bit about race and gender as a social construct um, and how that you know, how should people be thinking about that as they go off and they do their work? You know, some folks might be um, DEI practitioners, some folks might be um, data scientists or data analysts. How should we be thinking about race and gender as we go through and, and do our work? Uh, maybe we can start with McKinsey. So I think, you know, this is a question that I think about all the time, especially with the, the kind of work that we do at MMG. Um, and, and something that I like to really impress upon people is the fact that, yes, race and gender, just to give a few examples of, of identity-based constructs, are social constructs, and at the same time, the ways in which society has um, taken those social constructs and then used them to marginalize and to disenfranchise people are very real. So, like, I think it's about creating the balance of understanding that they are social constructs and that we, we, that to attempt to use um, the a singular sort of aspect of a person's identity as a means of defining them is always a bad direction, right? It's never something that we should be doing. And, and at the same time, right, there are ways in which we can be very aware or seek to be very aware of the ways in which our bias has been created towards people based on their identities, while also recognizing that because society has framed and, and created um, hierarchies of power and privilege based on those identities, that their lived experience with that disenfranchisement is very real and it should be something that we're paying attention to. I think in addition to that, just going back to the language piece, um, it's also about recognizing that language and our understanding of identity and, 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 and you know, that would include myself as a black queer non-binary person, my understanding of my identity evolves, right? And it's constantly evolving. So potentially five years ago, the way in which I the way in which I felt affirmed in terms of how people referred to me is very different now. So I think it's also about recognizing that there is not going to be a singular gold standard in terms of the ways in which we talk about these issues and we talk about inequities and oppressions. So it's it's important to be as as much as possible to be as mindful as possible and to be constantly researching and reading so that we don't get left behind, you know, in terms of our own evolution of understanding how people's understanding of their identities changes and, and you know, is, is constantly transforming. Yang, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the same um, question, like how race and gender as a social construct, you know, affected, you know, played, was a big part of the work that you did and, and how should people be, taking that, you know, what 
your experience was in, in this research to their own work? Yeah, um, I, I really love the question. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because when like upcoming data scientists are asking me for advice or mentorship, um, I know it's often focused on the technology, the tooling, you know, do I use Python or R? And um, I, I will ask them, my favorite question to ask them is, what do you know about history? Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know how many data scientists are asked that question, but, you know, when Mackenzie is talking about race and racism, you know, gender and sexism, for example, you know, I'm thinking about the history of how those terms even came to be um, and how, why did we invent race as a social construct even? And, you know, there's this distinction between race and racism. And I, you know, in terms of language choice, again, in our studies, we often talk about, oh, race explains this in a way that, you know, can't be explained. For example, the racial wealth gap. Um, you know, and I would question, is it race that explains that? Or is it the system of racism predicated on the social invention of race um, that continues to drive this racial wealth gap? Um, and I think that's where, you know, we really want to acknowledge that data can answer the what, um, but to understand the why and the how, uh, it takes a lot of other ways of knowing. It takes a lot of being in deep relationship with the communities we're studying. Um, again, you know, to your earlier point, Ellen, coming from the communities that we're studying um, and making sure that, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about getting that perfect number. It's about really advocating for people who are invisibilized um, and not being heard. And you know, I think to that to that question, um, there's really interesting ways of seeing how obvious um, our power as data storytellers is. Um, and just you know, two things I'll cite here is um, just seeing how the U.S. Census has changed the constructions of race and gender over time. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll quickly link to an example here. Um, but you'll note that it's essentially a history lesson in how data is used to perpetuate um, these you know, systemic oppressions. And uh, you know, in another instance, again, this is, you know, this is not just about history. This history is our present day reality. Um, Another example of note is that, you know, in uh, France, Germany, and the UK, there is this refusal, um, and in some cases, an illegality to gather data on racial identity. Um, and what that does is it fails to acknowledge that if we can't racially disaggregate data, um, it's actually a refusal to recognize patterns of racism. Um, so it's not just about, you know, we're labeling people in a certain way, it's about how these constructs have been used to harm people um, historically and also today. Um, and so, you know, when I think about, you know, data scientists and our role as uh, data storytellers, I think about, you know, what do you what do you know about history, um, and what do you know about how that shows up today? Um, and before we move on, and people should ask questions um, in the Q and A window. Um, McKinsey, you sent a link, um, hopefully Rigo can share that with the um, attendees, um, saying that this is a resource uh, of a resource that you share with data analysts and data scientists. Love to hear a little bit about why that, what, what you like about that piece and why it's important. Um, well, the title of the video is, um, is Race Debunked, I think, in three minutes. So one of the reasons I like to share it is because uh, it's three minutes long. And so I really want, if, depending on who I'm talking to, I really want them to finish it. And so I'm like, hey, here's something that's just three minutes, please watch it. It gets into, which is why I think it's so interesting what you mentioned, Yang, because it actually does get into the US census discussion, where it's speaking specifically about um, Latinx communities and the, and the ways in which specifically Mexican immigrants um, had constantly had their identity markers changed from white to, to Mexican to, you know, other identity markers, depending on where the U.S. was at the time and how much of a need it had for, um, for, for um, forced labor. And so I think 
you know, for me, I, I really appreciate it as a reference because it goes all the way back to the ways in which the actual um, markers of race were created and for what purpose, right? And, and I think it's, it's something that is digestible and, and hopefully pretty accessible for a lot of folks. I'd love to hear um, a little bit about, you know, some of the, um, you know, going back to the slide that Yang put up, one of the, you know, the first um, section was about power analysis. And McKinsey, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what um, are the power dynamics that we should be thinking about in all of our work and especially in DEI work. And one of the things that we found from our analysis was that there were not that many differences between the tech industry and other industries, between different geographies, between um, you know, the, you know, the different um, people who, who filled out the survey. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, on power analysis in this project. Yeah, so I think where I would, would start in responding to that is that I, for, especially for DNI practitioners and for researchers as well, I think right now, which I'm very happy about, we're having deeper and deeper conversations around race and gender um, and around the LGBTQIA plus community. And, and yet I think one of the spaces and areas where we lack is in having conversations around class. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's for a lot of folks maybe even given maybe their increased comfort level with, with having an engaging in conversation and work that's focused on dismantling racism um, and dismantling um, systems of white dominance and white supremacy. I think that the class conversation can be pretty scary for a lot of folks because then it's getting directly into economy, right? And it's our economy that makes it so that we're actually able to care for ourselves, to look out for our families, to feed ourselves, right? Um, to, to ensure that we can lead um, lives that are not centered in survival, but are centered in, in us thriving in our future and our past, present, and our present and future. And so I think um, that's one of those areas is something that we should definitely look at. I think for me, one of the reasons why I, I love being able to have intersectional conversations that also are conversations where we're talking about class. Um, and it's because I find that it, that it tends to help to decenter whiteness in conversations like that because then it becomes less about, right, the black and white conversation and more about recognizing the multiculturalism of oppression. Um, so that's one of the, the things that I like to, to sort of go into and to discuss. I think there are a lot of folks that need a lot of prep to be able to enter into that space and to apply it to the kind of research that we're discussing, but it is so important. And it also helps us to recognize that, for example, being black or being an indigenous person or Asian person, right, or being a, um, a uh, Latinx person, that, you know, the ways in which we experience our oppressions are heavily, heavily influenced and changed and shaped by our economy. Um, so I think for me, that's one of those things that in terms of power analysis that I find to be really important. I think also recognizing, you know, I know Yang had mentioned this and you had talked about this earlier as well, Ellen, but about that objectivity myth that because we think that it's possible for us to turn a switch on and be objective and then turn it off and not be objective when we don't wanna be, um, that a lot of times we don't, as researchers and as folks that are, that are leading research like this, we don't consider our own positionality and we don't think about our own power, right? I recognize that it's such a major privilege just to be able to um, be a part of research that is focused on harm in the remote workplace. That there are so many people in my community, especially from where I come from, who would never ever have that opportunity because of the ways in which they don't experience privilege like I experience it. So coming into a process like this, I come into it with so much humility and recognizing that just because I'm present um, and contributing and bringing value, it doesn't mean that I'm the only person that should be doing that or that, you know, that um, I have the, the most expansive sort of vast knowledge around the themes that we're discussing. But because I'm present, it, it means that I do have a responsibility to be as mindful as possible, not just of my marginalization, but also of the ways in which my privilege could be wielded to bring harm to other people. So it's a pretty long answer, but you all know that I'm, I'm very wordy. I mean, we worked together for eight months, so y'all know I'm verbose. <laughs> I, I, I worry about the class issues. I think you know, tech has been very good at creating two classes of employee, at least two, where you, know, you have, and we, tried very hard, thanks to Yang, to, you know, think of all of all of the people we surveyed as workers and 
not making the distinction between contractor and you know and part time and um, full time because of the way that um, things have uh, kind of the structures have been created within tech and it started many many decades ago. Um, so thank you for that. I think it's really important and just and remembering and being grateful for our privilege and and using our voices to to speak up for those who don't have that power. I think that's really important. Um, I'm going to go to we have a couple questions. Um, first question, and I think this is I think both are kind of related, and I think Yang is going to be so happy to answer these. Um, I have a person who's who's teaching an analytics course to undergraduates and wants to um, include some materials on equity audits. Um, are there some good materials available? And there's another person who has a similar question. Do you have any guides you look to when you plan and prepare research on UX? Um, this person, the second person is a service designer and a UX researcher and is looking for materials. And um, Yang was the source um, who provided a lot of the materials that we looked at. Um, thank you for that question. I love it. And I love that you're putting this into practice. I think at the end of the day, it's not about you know talking, it's about practice. Um, and uh, I'll definitely include a lot of links in the show notes, but I'll just mention a few here. Also, um, the Urban Institute has a racial equity analytics lab um, and uh, another project called Elevate Data for Equity, um, Data for Black Lives under the leadership of Yeshi Milner, um, actually just came out with a report on data capitalism. Um, and it's been really helpful for me personally to look at other people's reports on a variety of subjects. Um, you know, on experiences of sex workers, on environmental racism, on missing and murdered indigenous women, girls to spirit, trans people, on guaranteed basic income. Um, and I'll be writing a piece on data justice for Data Society's blog coming up soon, which will link to um, a lot of these more specific, you know, tools and practices. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing I'll want to mention is just thinking much more holistically about not just, uh, you know, Western statistical ways of knowing, um, but other ways of knowing for that, um, you know, I really want to thank Dr. Desi Small Rodriguez Lone Bear, um, who is creating the Data Warriors Lab, um, and as part of the United States Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network um, on alternative ways of knowing. Um, and, you know, I think the other part of that is, um, at the end of the day, these are tools, um, just like any tool that we have, and these are frameworks for equity. And um, I do want to make a distinction between data equity and data justice. And, you know, when I think about data equity, I think about given our current systems, the ones that we live in, the classes we have to teach, you know, um, the companies we're trying to, you know, do DEI in, given those systems, um, you know, what can we do? So going back to the US census, you know, how data equity would ask, like, how does the census reach and count and reflect the complexities of our most vulnerable communities. Um, and data justice, I would say, is a much more expansive and holistic practice. It's questioning the incentives, the impacts, and the existence of those systems in the first place. Um, so data justice might ask, like, you know, what is the purpose of the census? Like, why was it made? Um, whose interests it ultimately serves? Um, and, you know, imagines like if we can abolish these more harmful data practices, um, what does it look like to create these more regenerative ones that are, you know, community led and community based. Um, and so I think as part of that, on a very personal note, I think it helps a lot to, you know, not be studying the people that you don't know about, but really to be studying and bring recognition to the things that you are experiencing. And you know, if you are advocating for um, other people to be, really be in deep relationship with them, um, and that you know that kind of personal level deep relationship uh, helps to build trust, helps to expand beyond our own positionality, um, and helps us to make sure that whatever tool we are using, whatever practice we are using, that you know we're really um, reflective about who that's helping. I think that makes so much sense. It's um, it's not easy, but it's worth putting in that effort, I think. Um, I have a question that um, I'm gonna direct to McKinsey uh, from actually from Rigo. 
and uh, he's interested in knowing what you would say to an organization about to begin a DEI process. Um, I really love that question. Thank you, Rigo. I think that something that I would say, um, given that I've, I've been on so many calls <laughs> with leaders and organizations and with organizers and organizations that are beginning um, DEI focused processes. And so one of the things that I often say is that you're not ready and that's okay that you're going to do it anyway and you're going to proceed but recognizing that um like for example with the conversation that we were having just now around potentially an equity audit in, a com in an, an organization that it's not like a financial audit and i think sometimes people think of it as cut and dry i show up i do all the right things i get the results then i do all the right things again and then i'm done versus hey a, a, a dei process that actually is informed by principles of justice and anti-oppression means that um, we are extending a lot of our own emotional labor and that we're not just focused on the company or the organization, but we're focused on ourselves, on ourselves as individuals, um, changing and transforming, and also an interpersonal transformation. And that's really difficult. So um, it's for me about priming folks so they recognize there's gonna be a lot of things that happen in the process that are gonna make you feel vulnerable and that um, also are gonna make you feel uncomfortable and it's gonna be okay because that's what the work is like as opposed to them thinking they're gonna check some boxes, be done um, and it's gonna and it's gonna go always feel great and they're always gonna feel like they're doing the right thing, but really helping folks to, to um, be equipped with the tools so they can humanize themselves in the process. That's super helpful, thank you. Um, and here's, a, the questions are getting harder so they are, people are getting more comfortable, which is great. Um, this is for both of you. How can we navigate guilt in remote workplaces that may be quote unquote better than environments that are more obviously harmful? So in other words, how can people employed at you know, good places to work bear witness to and be in conversation with people in more obviously violent remote environments while still tending to their own well-being, so this is a um, this is a hard question, and I'm I'm really glad that somebody asked it. I think if I were to rephrase the question, for me, just to sort of help with with the framing around this, um, it's like me asking someone, "How do you offer the support to someone who's grieving?" Right. And, and when you're offering support to someone who's who's grieving, because to be in an environment that is toxic and that's harming you, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be in a state of grief because you are losing, you're losing time, you're losing energy, right? You are um, experiencing a lot of really difficult working dynamics that you really shouldn't even be, you really shouldn't even have to experience within a remote workplace. So if uh, someone that you knew came to you and said, I'm having a really difficult time with XYZ, or I've just experienced loss, you definitely wouldn't respond by saying, oh, well, I haven't had that experience. My life is great, right? But, but instead, you'd be showing up in a way that's really present, doing a lot of listening, offering support. And then also, um, as opposed to offering that open-ended, you know, well, call me if you need anything, because you know that they're in a state of need, you may not know what they need. I think it's about thinking about your own bandwidth and capacity and your boundaries and coming up with a very short list of things that you can offer. You know, so if, for example, if they're looking to, to, to leave that, that specific organization or company, it could be, well, you know what, I can dedicate two hours on a Friday after work and I can help you find um, potential other, potentially other places where you can be applying to. Or if it's potentially, you know, um, they're in a, in a place where they're not looking to leave, they want to stay and they need a listening ear, it could be, well, hey, you know, on Wednesdays, for like 30 minutes at such and such a time during lunch or whatever, um, I can give you a call and I can check on, in on you on a regular basis to see how you're doing, to see how you're feeling. So I think really it's about recognizing what our capacity and bandwidth is, because it's 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 interesting to think about the ways in which, even if you're not in a situation and you're not in a toxic remote workplace environment, the people that are, that, that has a cascading and expansive effect on all the people that, that are within their community. So it's not just about, it's not just impacting one person's life or a group of individuals' lives. So it's also about being mindful of the ways in which um, those stories of that kind of trauma and harm are gonna impact you. 
and ensuring that you really have bandwidth and capacity to be able to hold the space. And if you don't, helping that person to be able to find resources and people that, that do have the bandwidth and the capacity. That was one of the things that, um, one of the words that came up a lot during our research, trauma, that people were actually experiencing trauma from COVID-19 in the remote workplaces. And it wasn't just trauma from COVID-19, it was trauma from dealing with um, racism, ongoing racism, but all heightened by the murder of George Floyd and the protests that have gone on for the past year. Um, and there was climate change, uh, it, uh, you know, horrible, incidents of climate change that were um, devastating to people's homes or people's health or, um, or, you know, just the stability that they were feeling. And, you know, all of these different traumas really, um, it's, it is interesting and really helpful to think of it as people grieving and needing that space and, and, and how would you respond? And it's not just do your job and it's not just go do your work and pretend it's not happening. Um, and I, and, I, and I think the piece that was also very um, helpful for me to understand is that all of these pieces, like this, this trauma from all of these outside forces plus from COVID-19, the um, harassment and hostility people are experiencing, the work pressures they're feeling, um, the anxiety that they're experiencing, it was all kind of building up on top of each other. So the more anxious you are, you know, perhaps the more likely you are to be hostile or to harass somebody or to feel more work pressure or to put more work pressure on your coworkers or your reports. And that, um, you know, it, it is a complex system and it's hard to, it's hard to, um, and, and you have to be thoughtful about how you're going to address it. I'd love to hear your thoughts, Yang. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just furiously nodding my head. <laughs> Uh, whoever asked this question, I really love the question. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm hearing sort of like maybe three things in the question you're asking. So the first thing I'm hearing is this notion of guilt. Um, and, you know, when I think about that, I think about how we can see this as a story of centering ourselves and asking, you know, by centering ourselves and our guilt, who are we decentering in that process? Um, and, you know, asking like if we are stuck in our guilt, how can we, you know, become unstuck um, so that we can, you know, act on it. And I think often behind guilt is a kind of fear or shame. Um, and, you know, I, I know there are many people who talk about this. Brene Brown obviously studies this very deeply. Um, and, you know, when I think about that, I think it's, it's actually very, uh, it's actually very important that we do, you know, move ourselves from a place of stuck in this and that guilt to a place of how do we act on it and I think by doing that it actually alleviates some of that guilt in the first place because now we're you know we're not just sitting there observing we are um, actively participating um, the other thing I'm hearing is in the second part of that question is around rest making sure that we're not burning out making sure that you know we're not going to like five protests and then um, not being able to get anything else in our lives done and taking care of ourselves. Um, and, you know, when I think about that, I think of just how many things we've internalized growing up in this kind of society, um, in this kind of, you know, capitalistic, extractive labor society. And our notions, you know, we talk about this in the report, our notions of activity and productivity as a value of our humanity rather than just, you know, seeing that our humanity has inherent worth. Um, and so when I think about that, I think about how, you know, maybe there's also a guilt or shame around rest. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, I have, my, I have my tea right here. I think it's important that you take the time and the practices to figure out what rest looks like to you and when you need to take it. And um, to reframe the guilt around that, I would say, you know, we're not going to solve any of these oppressions in a day. Um, we're not going to solve it by applying data equity. We're not going to solve it um, by going to a protest, but we are going to move and make progress on it collectively in community and through, uh, you know, through time. And so when you're resting, like trust that your community is going to rise up. And when they're resting, trust that, you know, you will rise up. 
Um, so when I think about that framing, I think about my rest allows me to continue this work in a whole lifetime practice um, rather than just tomorrow. And then I think the last thing I'm hearing is the sense of, you know, I'm in a good workplace, but there's like a really nasty workplace there that, you know, maybe my friend is part of, or maybe, you know, I hear about. Um, and I would question, you know, just how, how good of that workplace um, really is. And I think this goes back to what, you know, Ellen McKenzie said earlier about, you know, you may not be able to see everything that's going on for other people in the same way that they won't see everything that's going on for you. And uh, I think about, you know, our spheres of influence and our spheres of power. And you have a sphere of influence, you have a sphere of power, whatever that may be. And it's probably, you know, you're probably able to make more moves in your own organization than in another organization. And so, you know, I would maybe ask myself, like, what, what am I not seeing um, in the ways that my organization, like myself, have been, you know, indoctrinated by the system? Um, and how can I use my own power and spheres of influence to, you know, make that better? Um, and, you know, I think when we come back to our report, uh, you know, we, we talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, and, you know, I, I want to quote Dante Stewart here, uh, who says, there's a difference between diversity and inclusion and liberation and justice. One enjoys the feeling of my presence, the other embraces the fullness of my humanity. Um, and so I think when we think about embracing the fullness of our humanity, both ours and everyone else's, um, it can really help, you know, move us into action. And that was one of the reasons why I was so grateful to Data and Society for um, giving us this opportunity to talk with folks. We hope that you all are you're going to take, you know, what we've learned and what we've shared into your own work and that we can spread a ripple effect across um, all sorts of research and all sorts of um, information. And um, I want to thank everybody for participating. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. I want to thank Rigo, who has been an amazing facilitator and introducer and um, has helped uh, coordinate all of this and, and um, really made this a uh, wonderful event for, for us, um, uh, Diane and Eli, for helping with um, the, uh, behind the scenes. And then also, of course, Mackenzie and Yang, who I've learned so much from and I continue to learn from both of you and am um, just uh, delighted to have been able to work with you. And you know, I think we'll continue a little bit of research and hopefully we'll be able to um, join forces again and, and keep continuing this work, which I think is really important. Thank you so much, Ellen, for guiding us through this incredible conversation. Um, by evidence from the q and I feel like we just are beginning to warm up into the depths of this discussion. Um, but we are unfortunately out of time. And I so just want to take this moment to give a huge shout out to the three of you, my guests today, our guests today. Ellen Powell of Project Include, Yang Hong of Social Insights, and uh, Mackenzie Mack of MMG. Uh, please stay tuned for um, the afterlife of this of this conversation. We will be posting the recording as well as the show notes in our on our web chats, website on the event page. Um, I want to again encourage everyone to please check out the report. Uh, I'm going to link the, the report again here in the chat, and it will be included along with all the amazing knowledge that was dropped today in the show notes. Um, and with that, I just want to say, have a beautiful rest of your day. Keep an eye out also for uh, a piece that Yang is working on for our points blog on data equity and data justice, which should be coming out soon. Um, and again, Please follow the work of these three amazing uh, researchers. Um, and hopefully you will join us again soon for another conversation. Mm -hmm.